Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India This is Dr. Vishal Trivedi from Department of Biosciences and Bioengineering, IIT Guwahati. Let us continue our discussion about the different host and uh, what we have, uh, but before we uh, discuss further, uh, let us recap what we have discussed so far. So what we have discussed so far? Uh, so in the previous module, uh, we have discussed uh, the uh, the introduction of uh, we have discussed about the structure of prokaryotic cell we have discussed about the structure of eukaryotic cell within this we have also discussed about the different organelles which are present in the eukaryotic cell their structure their uh, function as well as uh, we have also discussed what is their relevance in uh, in 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 contributing into the different activities which are uh, which are in, uh, which are which are important for the eukaryotic cell then we have also discussed about the crucial and significant differences between the prokaryotic as well as the eukaryotic cell and these differences uh, are important because once you know these differences you could be able to exploit or you could be able to use the prokaryotic cell as well as the eukaryotic cell uh, for uh, for uh, for downstream applications in the in the in the biotechnology because depending on the applications you can choose the prokaryotic cell or the eukaryotic cell then we have also discussed about the difference between the plant cell as well as the animal cell and as as we discussed before these differences are also important to know what are the limitations or what are the technological uh, limitations you have or what are the technical challenges you are going to face when you use the plant cell or the animal cell as a source of host for uh, for any type of biotechnology applications and at the end uh, uh, we have also discussed how you can isolate the different organelles in a eukaryotic cell uh, we have also discussed uh, in the same thing we have also discussed uh, the isolation of the periplasmic fraction as well as the cytosol from the prokaryotic uh, cell as well and uh, uh, in in this section uh, in this ch uh, chap lecture we have also discussed about the different techniques which you can use to isolate the different organelles uh, present in a eukaryotic cell these uh, ap approaches or the techniques uh, can be utilized even for the different uh, 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 not only for isolating the organelles but also for uh, isolating the different types of biomolecules which are varying in their sedimentation rate or which are varying in terms of their uh, different densities. So these are the different things what we have discussed. So what we have discussed so far is actually enable you to un understand uh, the in uh, the uh, the information or the requirement of the host uh, which we are going to use in the biotechnology applications apart from these uh, uh, resources the host cell is also depends extensively on the metabolic reactions which they are going to catalyze and these metabolic reactions are been used for many purposes so let's see what we are what are the different metabolic reactions are occurring in the host cells so uh, what we have discussed we have discussed about the prokaryotic cell we have discussed about the animal cell and then we have also discussed about the plant cells and all these cells all these host uh, specific cells are re requires the uh, the energy and this energy they require to run the various metabolic reactions 
to drive its uh, life cycle or life spans and to divide and uh, grow from one, one, one cell to more, many, many more cells. And there are two, majorly there are two different types of metabolic reactions which uh, are, uh, go, uh, which are happening in a, in a host cells. These are called anabolic reactions or the catabolic reactions. Uh, these anabolic reaction as the name suggests, these are called as the biosynthetic pathway. So, anabolic reactions are the reactions in which the new uh, biomolecules are being synthesized, whereas the catabolic reactions are the re energy producing reactions, which means in the catabolic reactions, you are actually generating, you are uh, generating the ATP uh, by the breakdowns of the biomolecule and then this ATP you are using for running the life cycle or running the different activities within the cell. So, uh, there are, um, uh, so these are the two uh, majorly uh, processes which are happening in a, in any, any of these prokaryotic cells, uh, any of these host cells, whether it is a prokaryotic cell, animal cell or the plant cell. So, let us discuss about these reactions. So, we will start with the uh, glucose metabolism. So, in the glucose metabolism, as soon as the glucose molecules enter into a cell, it is being, uh, it is being uh, channelized into a, uh, in a series of metabolic reactions, so that you can produce the ATP as well as the reducing equivalent and all these reducing equivalent as well as the ATP is being used to produce the energy. So, the first metabolic pathway what we are going to discuss is called as the glycolysis. Glycolysis is operating in a uh, in cytosol of the cell, uh, whether it is the bacterial cell or the, or the eukaryotic cell. So, the first reaction which is required to, uh, to channelize the glucose molecules into the glycolysis is which is catalyzed by an enzyme known as the hexokinase. So, the hexokinase uh, ut utilizes the glucose, it can utilize any uh, uh, six, carbon, uh, gluc uh, 6 carbon sugar and with the help of ATP and magnesium as a cofactor, hexokinase generates the glucose 6 phosphate and then glucose 6 phosphate is being isomerized in the fructose 6 phosphate. So, irrespective of whether you have a glucose, fructose, mannose or maltose, um, all these sugar molecules are being accepted by the hexokinase to generate their corresponding the uh, uh, 6 phosphate. For example, in the case of fructose, it will generate the fructose 6 phosphate. In the case of glucose, it will generate the glucose 6 phosphate. So, if and after that, there is a isomerase reactions. This isomerase will convert all these forms to the fructose 6 phosphate. So, if you remember, in this place, you are actually spending 1 ATP to uh, commit the glucose molecule into the glycolysis. Once the fructose 6 phosphate is generated, it is again getting phosphorylated on the other carbon, and then you are generating the fructose 1 6 bis phosphate. The enzyme is phosphofructokinase and one other molecule of ATP is being utilized in this process. Once the fructose 1,6-bisphosphate is being generated, then the fructose 1,6-bisphosphate is being split by the aldolase in the two uh, molecules. Uh, one is called glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate or the other molecule is called as dihydroxyacetane phosphate. These two molecules, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate or the dihydroxyacetane phosphate are the isomers. So, these molecules can convert to each other by the, with the help of an enzyme known as phosphotriose isomerase. Irrespective of these, uh, the formation of any of these molecules, the glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate is being further processed to form the 1,3-bis 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate and the enzyme is known as the glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate dehydrogenase and in this process you are generating, you are using the NAD plus NPI and you are generating the first molecule of NADH. These NADH molecules are being, are, are called as the reducing equivalent, they will be further used in the downstream uh, uh, reactions 
to generate the ATP. Then 1,3-bisphosphate glycerate is being uh, converted into the 3-phosphoglycerate and the enzyme name is the phosphoglycerate kinase. This means you are removing the one phosphate molecule from this, mo from this uh, compound and this phosphate molecule is being received by the ATP to generate the ATP. So, uh, since you are generating the two molecule of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, you are going to generate the two molecules of ATP. Then the 3-phosphoglycerate is being converted into 2-phosphoglycerate. The, uh, which is actually just the, just the uh, change in position of the phosphate within the molecule. And then from this molecule, you are generating the phosphoenol pyruvate. This is a dehydration reaction where uh, uh, you are going to have a loss of water and the enzyme name is the enolase. And then from phosphoenol pyruvate, uh, it will be get converted into the pyruvate, which means again you are going to lose another phosphate molecule and this phosphate molecule is going to be received by the ADP to generate the ATP. So now if you see very carefully, you are having the multiple places. So in, in, in initially when you started with the glucose, you are spending two ATPs, one at this place, the other one is at this place. So you are spending two ATP molecule to channelize the molecule, to channelize the, uh, the glucose into the, uh, into the uh, glycolysis. But you are generating two molecules of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate uh, and at the end, the glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate is getting converted into the NADH and this NADH is going to be into the electron transport chain and the elect in, within the electron transport chain, it will going to generate the ATP, which means you have uh, spent two ATPs in the initial two reactions and with the generation of NADH, you have produced the ATP. And in the second reaction, you with the, with the section of phosphate molecule from the 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate, you have generated two molecules of ATP. And and the, in the last step, when the phosphoenol pyruvate is also losing another P, uh, phosphate molecule, you are generating another two molecules of ATP. Which means, if you see the balance sheet of ATP production from a glycolysis, uh, you will see that the with, the with the glycolysis, you are gaining many ATP by spending two ATP in the first reaction. So let us see the uh, glycolysis, the balance sheet. The balance sheet is like this as we discussed. In step 1 to 4, uh, you are actually spending 2 ATPs and then in the, in the subsequent step when you are, uh, you are generating 2 molecules of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate and in the step 6, you are generating the NADH and each NADH molecule when it goes for the electron transport chain, it generates 3 ATP which means from the 2, AT, from the two NADH molecule, you are going to get the 6 ATPs. Then in the step 7, when there was a loss of phosphate, you are going to generate 2 ATP and in the last step when the pyruvate is being generated, you are going to generate another 2 ATP. So what is the net balance? If you take the single molecule of glucose, what you have generated is the 6 plus 2 plus 2 which is 10 and the 2 ATP molecule you have generated in the initial uh, 4 steps so that you are activating the uh, glucose and that is being the consumption. So at the end of the one glucose molecule uh, when it is getting oxidized in the glycolysis, you are generating the 8 molecules of ATP. So, when the glucose molecules enter into the glycolysis, you can see that you are actually spending 2 ATP molecules, but in return, you are getting the 8 molecules back. But as the glucose enters into the cell and the glycolysis operates, all these uh, uh, events are uh, under the tight control. So let us see what are the factors are controlling the glycolysis reactions within the cell. 
So uh, within the uh, within the uh, cell, you have the uh, transporters which are present on the cell surface, and one of the uh, hormone which is called as the insulin. And the insulin hormone, when it binds to the insulin receptor, it drives the downstream event or downstream signaling, and because of that, it actually control it regulates the glucose metabolism within the cell and how it happen is that in the first event the glucose insulin binds to its receptor in the cell membrane and that actually activates the insulin on the uh, insulin insulin mediated downstream signaling uh, the once the insulin is uh, insulin mediated downstream signaling is activated it actually upregulates the uh, recruitment of glucose transporter which is GLUT3 and GLUT4 and these transporters then goes on to the cell membrane and they are available for the glucose transport. So as soon as they are available on the plasma membrane, they allow the glucose molecule to be coming inside the cell and as soon as the, these cells, these, these uh, glucose molecules are available they are being used or they will be available for the glycolysis. Uh, but you can imagine that if the glucose level is going uh, is very high uh, and the insulin level is going down then in that case all these events are going to be reversed. The, the, the glucose transporter which are present on the cell surface are being internalized into the vesicles and then ultimately they are being going to be degraded to form to in, into the endosomal, red, endosomal system and that is how the level of insulin uh, glucose receptors on the cell surface is going to be reduced. Once the glucose receptors on the uh, cell surface is going to be reduced, the entry of the glucose is going to be less and as a result the downstream glycolysis is going to be less. Apart from this glucose mediated uh, control, you also have the control at the within the insulin uh, within the glycolysis reaction which are operating in the cell and these uh, regulations are mostly either by the feedback mechanism or the by covalent modifications so in the uh, in the uh, at the enzymatic level you have two different types of uh, uh, um, uh, two different types of uh, regulations one is called the covalent modifications and the other one is called as the allosteric regulations. So let us discuss about the covalent modifications. So in the covalent modification, the example is the pyruvate kinase. The pyruvate kinase which is actually, uh, which is actually take, uh, taking up the phosphate from the phosphoenol pyruvate and it is generating the pyruvate. And you can see that as the uh, enzyme is uh, phosphoenzyme or this pyruvate kinase could be present in two form, one is phosphorylated form, the other one is the unphosphorylated or the native form. The, so the dephosphorylated form uh, is more active uh, and whereas the phosphorylated form is less active. So you can imagine when there is a low blood glucose which means that it is going to reduce the activity of glycolysis. So in this low blood glucose event what happen is that the dephosphorylated pyruvate kinase is going to be phosphorylated and it will generate the phosphorylated pyruvate kinase which is going to be the less active. But when the blood glucose will go up and in that process what will happen is the phosphorylated pyruvate kinase is getting converted back to the dephosphorylated pyruvate kinase and that actually is going to be more active and it is going to catalyze more uh, enhanced uh, action or enhanced level of the conversion of phosphoenol pyruvate to pyruvate. Apart from this regulation which is actually a covalent modification, the fructose 1,6 bisphosphate, if you remember in the initial 1 to 4 reactions, fructose is being phosphorylated by the uh, um, phosphorylated by another round and that has generated the fructose 1,6 bisphosphate that actually is uh, positively regulating the conversion of phosphoenol pyruvate to pyruvate whereas 
if there is a sufficient quantity of ATP or the alanine is present inside the cell, it is negatively regulating which means if you have enough amount of ATP in the cell, it actually inhibits these reactions or it will uh, block the conversion of phosphoenolpyruvate to pyruvate which means if you have sufficient energy, there is no reason that you actually utilize the glucose which is present inside the cell through glycolysis. The other kind of uh, uh, modification which is called allosteric regulations. So, in the allosteric regulation is uh, uh, where the uh, molecule is uh, regulated in a different mechanism. So, uh, every enzyme has the allosteric site and in the allosteric site the, sub, uh, the substrate or the another molecule actually goes and bind and that is how it actually modulates their activity. So, uh, you can imagine uh, uh, this is the, that the fructose 6 phosphate is getting converted into fructose 1 6 bis phosphate and this reaction is catalyzed by the phosphofructokinase. So, phosphofructokinase has the allosteric binding site for fructose 2 6 bis phosphate which is neither a substrate or nor the product of this reaction and because of that it actually modulates its activity. Similarly, the fructose 1 6 bis phosphatase which actually do going to drive the reverse reaction is also been uh, having the allosteric binding site for fructose 1 6 bis phosphate and fructose 2 6 bis phosphate is positively regulating the activity of fructose phosphofructokinase 1 and that means if the if the fructose 2 6 bis phosphate is present it will it will activate the reaction or it will uh, enhance the uh, catalytic conversion rate of phosphofructokinase and as a result you are going to have more level of uh, the uh, fructose 1 6 bis phosphate which will eventually get converted into the pyruvate whereas if there is a uh, if there is a sufficient quantity then the, uh, the uh, fructose 2 6 bis phosphate is going to be uh, negatively regulated. So, at the, uh, at the same time fructose, 1, 6, fructose 2 6 bis phosphate negatively regulate or neg will reduce the activity of fructose 1 6 bis phosphatase which means it on, the, on one, one hand it increases the activity of phosphofructokinase so that will increase the phosphorylation reaction on the other hand it will reduce the activity of phosphatase and by doing so fructose 2 6 bis phosphate allosterically favors the formation of fructose 1 6 phosphate. Once the fructose 2 6 bis phosphate function is over that fructose 2 6 bis phosphate get converted into fructose 6 phosphate and that is how it actually its effects are going to be uh, controlled. Now, let us move on to the next reaction and next reaction once you generated the pyruvate that pyruvate will enter into the next, uh, cat uh, next catalytic uh, uh, reaction or next uh, metabolic reactions. So, pyruvate once it is generated in the cytosol it will uh, transported to the mitochondria this transporter this transport is never been in the pyruvate form. The pyruvate get converted into the acetyl CoA and then the acetyl CoA moved in to the mitochondria and catalyzed the downstream reactions and uh, uh, these reactions which are uh, occurring inside the mitochondria are called as the Krebs cycle. So, let us see what are the reactions are happening inside the Krebs cycle. So, as we discussed the pyruvate which is actually being generated from the uh, glycolysis uh, is getting converted into the acetyl CoA. The enzyme name is pyruvate dehydrogenase complex and once this acetyl CoA is being generated, it is being used to catalyze the first reaction of Krebs cycle as the name suggests the Krebs cycle is being discovered by a scientist name as the Hans Krebs and it is actually the multiple reactions which are being used to catalyze the different steps to uh, generate the ATP as well as the reducing equivalent. So, the oxaloacetate which is being present 
combined with the acetyl CoA in the first reaction, the enzyme name is citrate synthase to generate the citrate. The citrate is being utilized by the aconitase. It is a dehydration reaction, so one water molecule is being lost and that is how it generates and produces the cis aconitase. Cis aconitase generate the isocitrate. Now this isocitrate is being used by the isocitrate dehydrogenase, isocitrate dehydrogenase and in this reaction the first time the isocitrate is converted into the oxalosuccinate and a one molecule of NADH is being produced. So this is the first NADH which is being produced in the Krebs cycle. Uh, after the oxalosuccinate, it there is a decarboxylation reactions and it reduces it loses its one molecule of carbon and it get converted into the alpha ketoglutarate. Alpha ketoglutarate is uh, being converted into the succinyl CoA and the one molecule of NADH is being produced. This is the second uh, NADH molecule and the succinyl and the enzyme name is alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase and the another second molecule of carbon dioxide is being released. So the, this is second molecule of carbon dioxide, this is the first molecule of carbon dioxide. Now the succinyl CoA is being converted into the succinate and if you see very carefully in this step the GTP is being produced instead of ATP. So the first molecule of GTP is being produced. Now the succinate is being converted into the fumarate with the help of enzyme known as succinate dehydrogenase and the another molecule of FADH is being produced which is actually the first molecule of the FADH2 which is a reducing equivalent. So, so far we have generated the, in the Krebs cycle we they, they have generated two molecules of NADH. Now the and the one molecule of FADH2 and the one molecule of GTP. Now the fumarate is getting converted into the malate with the help of an enzyme known as fumarase and the amylate is getting converted into the oxaloacetate and the third molecule of NADH is being produced. So this is the third molecule of NADH which means you are generating the three molecules of NADH, one molecule of FADH2 and one molecule of GTP. So at the end the oxaloacetate which is being generated again goes through this cycle and uh, combined with the acetyl CoA to generate the citrate and that is how this is called as the Krebs cycle because this is a cyclic reactions occurring one after other. How people know that this is a cyclic reaction? Uh, so the uh, Hans Krebs has done many experiments and ultimately he has figured out that this is a cyclic events occurring because if you block any of these substrates and you does not allow or suppose you uh, inhibit the fumarase, you could be able to block the Krebs cycle or you disrupt the convergence of this one product into another product. So at the end what you are getting out of the Krebs cycle, what you, what you are getting is three molecules of NADH, one molecule of FADH, one molecule of the GTP and the two molecules of carbon dioxide. Let us see what is the balance sheet of the Krebs cycle. So in a balance sheet of one carbon uh, Krebs cycle, you always remember that you have generated the two molecule of pyruvate from the one molecule of glucose. So the initial reaction is that in the first acetyl CO is generated. So you have seen that in when the pyruvate got converted into the acetyl CO, it has generated the one molecule of NADH. Then in the step 3 when there was a generation of alpha ketoglutarate another NADH is being generated. So this is the first NADH, this is the second NADH. Then in the step 4 when there was a succinyl CoA uh, generated 
then also uh, there was a generation of uh, the reducing equivalence and then in the step 5 there was a generation of GTP, 1 GTP is equivalent to ATP, so that is how you can have the 1 uh, ATP or GTP. Then when the, there was a generation of fumarate, you have generated the FADH, so F1 molecule of FADH when it goes through the ATS, uh, uh, ATS uh, oxidation or when it goes for oxidation into the electron transport chain, it generates the 2 molecule of ATP. And then the last step you generated the oxaloacetate and that actually also given the 1 NADH. So that is how you have generated the 3 ATP. So let us see what is the net balance. So net balance of 1 molecule of pyruvate molecule when it got into the oxidation you have generated the 15 ATP molecule. And in the glycolysis you have generated 2 molecules of pyruvate that means from 1 molecule of glucose you have generated the 30 ATP molecule which means you have generated 30 ATP uh, from the Krebs cycle and you have generated the 8 ATP from the glycolysis which means if you, uh, if, you, um, if you oxidize one molecule of glucose you will get the total 38 ATP if the all these reducing equivalent for, will go for the complete oxidation. Similar to, uh, similar to glycolysis, the Krebs cycle is also under the tight control. Uh, it is being regulated by at many steps, uh, at many by many enzymes and by different types of mechanisms. So let us see what are these mechanisms to control the Krebs cycle. So the, the Krebs cycle is always or mostly being regulated by a feedback mechanisms where the, uh, the, the, the substrates such as for example for the first reaction you are converting the pyruvate to the acetyl CoA in these cases the pyruvate uh, the ADP NAD plus coenzyme A fatty acid calcium these are going to be uh, increase these activities so if there is an increase in the level of NAD plus or if there is an increase in the level of ADP uh, what this mean is that the cell is uh, having the less energy which means you need to run the Krebs cycle to produce the energy. So that is why these factors are going to enhance the activity of or enhance the activity of the enzyme which will catalyze the conversion of pyruvate to acetyl-CoA. Once the acetyl-CoA will, 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 will combine with the oxaloacetate to, uh, to form the citrate, at this step also the ADP which is actually the significance of the loss of ATP or low level of ATP in the cell is going to uh, enhance or will, will activate these reactions. Whereas the, if you have the large quantity of ATP, NADH, acetyl-CoA or the fatty acid that is going to go the, uh, that is going to inhibit these reactions. Same is true for when you do a conversion of isocitrate to alpha ketoglutarate, that time also ADP and calcium are going to be the positive modulator, they will enhance the activity whereas the ATP and NADH is going to uh, inhibit or will going to uh, do a inhibition of these activities. Same is true for the other steps as well. So the Krebs cycle is mostly being regulated by the uh, feedback mechanism means the, if the ATP is being generated you have large quantity of ATP then the ATP will go and uh, will go and um, uh, inhibit the reactions but if the there is a large quantity of NAD or there is a large quantity of AD, AD, ADP in the cytosol which will signify that the cell is undergoing the low energy state then that actually is going to upregulate the activities of different enzymes and that is how it is going to enhance the different reactions and that is how you are going to see the uh, more uh, activity or more uh, Krebs cycle uh, running. So let us continue our discussion about the Krebs cycle and what we were discussing that the Krebs cycle is under the tight control and where 
the uh, various substrate as well as the products are causing the, uh, the feedback inhibitions. And uh, the question comes why the Krebs cycle is uh, so much tightly controlled. The, re the reason behind the uh, tight control of Krebs cycle is that the Krebs cycle is the central uh, metabolic pathway. So, just after the glycolysis which actually where the glucose is being break down and get converted into the pyruvic acid, uh, the pyruvic acid get enters into the mitochondria and then it actually enters into the central metabolic pathway which is actually called as the Krebs cycle. So, in the Krebs cycle, the, uh, the, the pyruvate which is being generated from the glycolysis is being uh, is, uh, processed further and then the, the several molecules of NADH, FADH2 as well as the molecule of GTP is being generated. So, apart from the purpose of Krebs cycle to metabolize the uh, carbohydrate molecules to uh, provide the energy in the form of the reducing equivalent whether it is the NADH or the FADH2. Uh, the, the purpose of Krebs cycle is also to coordinate with many other uh, metabolic pathways. So, let us see how the Krebs cycle uh, plays central role within the metabolism of an organism. So, as you can see the Krebs cycle uh, it is receiving the pyruvate from the glycolysis and then the pyruvate is getting converted into acetyl CoA and this acetyl CoA is actually uh, entering into the Krebs cycle and then it is getting processed uh, when, uh, with, uh, with the help of several intermediates and with these intermediates uh, it is producing the uh, reducing equivalent as well as the uh, free energy which is in the form of GTP and what you can see now is that the oxaloacetate. So, oxaloacetate is being uh, also been uh, channelized with the uh, phosphoenyl pyruvate. The phosphoenyl pyruvate can be converted back to the glucose and it also can be used to produce the, uh, the different types of uh, amino acids. And uh, so, as you can see the Krebs cycle is indirectly uh, 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 connected to the uh, phosphoenol pyruvate or the carbohydrate metabolism as well as the amino acid biosynthesis pathway with the help of oxaloacetate. Uh, in the uh, in, in a in an alternate pathway the oxaloacetate is also being uh, uh, used to synthesize the, uh, the aspartate and other amino acid and these amino acids the carbohydrate which is present in these amino acids can be used even to synthesize the purine as well as the pyrimidine which means the oxaloacetate is which is actually the part of the, uh, the Krebs cycle is playing central role in uh, connecting the, the Krebs cycle to the amino acid pathway, the nucleotide pathway and the as well as the resynthesis of glucose molecules. Similarly, what you can see is the citrate which is being synthesized in the Krebs cycle is uh, utilized for the biosynthesis of fatty acid as well as the esterol. Similarly, the alpha ketoglutarate, the alpha ketoglutarate is used to synthesize the glutamate and the glutamate is ultimately uh, producing the different types of amino acids which are uh, glutamine, proline and arginine. And what you can see also is the succinyl CoA. So, succinyl CoA is another intermediate which is present in the Krebs cycle, and that actually can be a precursor for synthesis of chlorophyll, uh, heme, as well as the porphyrins. So, different types of iron containing proteins could be synthesized using the succinyl CoA, which is actually the heme bound proteins. So, as you can see, the the TCA cycle is, is a central pathway, it is on one side it is converted to the amino acid pathway, on other side it is converted, it is linked to the, uh, it is linked to the uh, nucleotide bio, bio, biosynthesis pathway and on the other hand it is, in, it is, it is linked to the fatty acid synthesis, uh, alpha ketoglutarate is, uh, is, is linking the TCA cycle to the another type of amino acid synthesis and as well as the succinyl CoA is uh, connecting the uh, TCA cycle to the 
heme uh, uh, biosynthesis of heme or the porphyrins which means that if there is a uh, there is a requirement of these intermediates like for example if there is a requirement of glycine or serine it the krebs cycle can uh, donate or can utilize or can channelize some of these acetate molecule for the synthesis of glycine or the serine molecules similarly the other intermediate also can be used to to channelize the uh, glu carbohydrate molecule which are present in the tca cycle to some of these derivatives which means the krebs cycle can actually regulate the different in bio, different uh, metabolic intermediates which are being generated in the metabolic uh, which are being generated within the cell and it actually makes the tight control between the these intermediates uh, and because of this uh, uh, important role which krebs cycle play within the uh, within the metabolism the krebs cycle is under tight control by all these intermediates and uh, also as well as the intermediate which are been present in the krebs cycle itself but these are the situation happens and these are the things which krebs cycle is doing uh, uh, when the oxygen is present because krebs cycle is producing the large quantity of nadh uh, one molecules of fadh and the gtp this nadh and fadh which are being generated in the krebs cycle are need to be oxidized in the uh, in the electron transport chain so all these nadh and fadh are going to go to the electron transport chain where the different types of electron uh, receptors are going to receive these molecules and then they will gen they will uh, they will they are going to process the uh, electron which is been they are going to process the nadh or fadh2 to generate the atp which means and in this electron transport chain the oxygen is required so as a result the if the if there is a oxygen is present the krebs cycle will uh, will run these uh, intermediates and as well as there will be uh, energy generation but what will happen there will be no oxygen in the environment or there is a low oxygen in the environment so as we discussed if there is a oxygen the tca cycle will run and it actually will produce the carbon dioxide and the energy which is been in the form of atp so if oxygen is present the tca cycle will run it will generate the three molecules of carbon dioxide and it will uh, going to process the reducing equivalents to generate the atp but once the oxygen is not present the pyruvate which is been generated from the glycolysis is been channelized into two different pathways in one pathway it is going to be converted into the lactate and in this process the nadh which is being generated by the cell is going to be utilized to generate the nad plus in the other pathway where it utilizes the two enzyme one is called pyruvate decarboxylase the other one is called as the alcohol dehydrogenase it actually do the decarboxylation reaction first to generate the acetaldehyde from the pyruvate and then from the acetaldehyde it generates uh, it generates the ethanol where a one molecule of nadh is being used and the nadh is getting converted into nad plus so let's see and this these pathway which are operating in the absence of oxygen are called as the anaerobic oxidation let's discuss these two reactions separately and understand what is the significance of anaerobic oxidation in the metabolic pathway so uh, let's start first the first reaction which is the conversion of pyruvate to lactate so as as we said this pyruvate is uh, being generated from the glycolysis so in the from the glycolysis you have utilized the glucose molecule and then you have produced one molecule of pyruvate in the absence of oxygen the pyruvate will not enter into the krebs cycle instead the pyruvate will get converted into the lactate uh, or the lactic acid uh, this path 
and in this process the one molecule of NADH is being converted into the NAD plus and the enzyme which catalyzes this reaction is called as the lactate dehydrogenase. The, uh, these kind of reactions are occurring in the uh, mammalian cells as well as these uh, reactions are occurring um, in the bacterial system or the prokaryotic system. So, in the bacterial system what happen is that when the bacteria is growing under the anaerobic conditions it cannot utilize the uh, it, it cannot utilize uh, the, uh, the pyruvate into the downstream uh, biometabolic pathways and the once the pyruvate accumulates into the cell that actually uh, drives these reactions and the pyruvate get converted into the lactate uh, lactic acid in the presence of uh, the lactodehydrogenase. One of the classical example of the bacterial uh, species which is uh, utilizing this reaction uh, very optimally and, uh, uh, and, uh, and producing the lactate or the lactic acid is called lactobacilli. These lactobacilli are the bacteria which are responsible for generation of curd. So, these are the things we are which anyway we are going to discuss in a subsequent slide. Now, let us go to the second reactions. In the second reaction the pyruvate is getting converted into the alcohol or the ethanol. In this in this you have the two different reactions which are coupled and the first reaction is being catalyzed by the pyruvate decarboxylase. As the name suggests it is actually going to remove one, ox one molecule of carbon dioxide from the pyruvate molecules and that actually will generate the one molecule of acetaldehyde and once the acetaldehyde is being generated then the acetaldehyde is being processed by the alcohol dehydrogenase and the one molecule of NADH is being used to produce the NAD plus and the ultimately the acetaldehyde is getting converted into the ethanol. As the so, in this process the pyruvate is getting converted into the ethanol and these are the reactions which are very oftenly and uh, occurring in the yeast and that is how the people are using the yeast to produce the alcohol and this. Uh, so, let us see what, what are the different intermediates or what are the different uh, what is the mechanism of the pyruvate to alcohol conversion. So, as I, as I said this is the two step reaction in the first step the pyruvate is getting converted into the acetaldehyde. In this what will happen is the, uh, the, the pyruvate decarboxylase has the uh, TPP or the TPP as a, as a cofactor. So, TPP is present in the form of a carboanion and, and that actually binds the first molecule of the pyruvate. So, the first reaction is the deprotonation of TPP to form the TPP carboanion and that actually binds the, uh, the pyruvate. So, it attacks on the pyruvate molecule and that is how you are going to have the, uh, the complex. Once this complex is formed the one molecule of carbon dioxide is being removed and that is how you are going to have the, uh, the, uh, the intermediate. This intermediate is then been, uh, is, uh, is been stabilized by a resonance to generate this intermediate and ultimately in the step 4 uh, the, uh, from this intermediate you are going to have the protonation to generate the methyl derivative of the TPP and at the end the acetaldehyde is being generated. So, this acetaldehyde is being generated from these reactions and the TPP is being regenerated on the enzyme which actually catalyzes the same reaction again and again. So, that is how the uh, pyruvate is getting converted into the acetaldehyde following this kind of complicated reaction mechanism which is the and the reaction which uh, the enzyme which catalyzes this reaction is called as the pyruvate decarboxylase. Now, let us go to the next uh, reaction. So, once the acetaldehyde is being generated it is getting converted into the ethanol or the alcohol. 
So, and the enzyme which catalyzes this reaction is called as the alcohol dehydrogenase. So, alcohol dehydrogenase is a zinc bound enzyme. So, in the in the in the in the in the alcohol dehydrogenase, the active site zinc is actually binding the your acetaldehyde and the uh, it is taking up the uh, uh, so in the first step what happen is the substrate acetaldehyde is binding to the enzyme bound zinc with a coordinate bound and then the uh, the NADH is also binding to the enzyme in the second step and then in the third step there will be a uh, there will be a transfer of hydride ion from the NADH to reduce the uh, to reduce the acetaldehyde and once the acetaldehyde is uh, reduced it actually uh, ge generates a uh, 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 intermediate and that intermediate is getting the proton from the water molecules and the ultimately the NADH is getting converted into NAD plus and the uh, acetaldehyde is getting converted into the ethanol. So, let us recap again. So, uh, you then the reaction of acetaldehyde to alcohol is uh, generated uh, is, is catalyzed by the enzyme called alcohol dehydrogenase which is a zinc bound enzyme. So, the active site zinc is in the first step the active site zinc is binding the acetaldehyde and is also binding the NADH and then there is a transfer of hydride ion this transfer of hydride ion from the NADH to the acetaldehyde and that actually generates a intermediate and then this intermediate is getting the uh, proton or it is actually taking up the proton from the water and with the with the transfer of proton it actually generates the alcohol as well as the NAD plus as well as the NAD plus. So, uh, by doing this pyruvate is getting converted into the alcohol. So, what is the significance of anaerobic oxidation? What you can see is that in the anaerobic oxidation, so anaerobic oxidation has the significance both for driving the cellular physiology as well as it has the industrial relevance. So, let us discuss first the, uh, the uh, cellular role in the cellular physiology. So, under the normal conditions or the under the, ox the ox oxygen uh, in the presence of oxygen, the glucose is getting converted into the pyruvate and the pyruvate is getting converted into the energy with the help of TCA cycle, which means when we it is getting converted into energy, the NAD plus is getting converted into the NADH where and in the presence of in, whereas in the in the glycolysis also NADH is getting converted into NADH. But when there is a no oxygen this NADH cannot go for the oxidation which means the there will be a shortage of the NAD plus. And if there is a shortage of NAD plus, the ultimately there will be an accumulation of NADH in the cell and if that happens, if that happens the NADH, uh, the, the, the cell cannot produce the energy as well as cell cannot actually run many of the metabolic reactions where the NADH is required. So, in to avoid these circumstances where because you definitely need a pool of NAD plus so that you can actually run the metabolic reactions which are uh, which are important for the cell apart from producing the energy so because of that what happen is the cell is going with a with a loss making uh, loss making policies where the pyruvate is getting converted into the lactate and the pyruvate is getting converted into alcohol and in these two processes what is happening you are actually generating the NAD plus because you are utilizing the NADH which is already been preformed in the cell and because of that you are going to generate a pool of NAD plus and these pool of NAD plus can be used for the 
metabolic reactions or alternate metabolic reactions where uh, to the to the some extent until the oxygen is not available for the cell and that actually helps to the cell to survive for a longer period of time and also it actually which is, uh, allows the cell to the uh, uh, to withstand the stress which are being generated in the in the absence of oxygen now let's discuss about the industrial relevance or the industrial importance of this anaerobic oxidation in the first step the pyruvate is getting converted into ethanol with the help of the carbon dioxide so there will be a removal of carbon dioxide so the the classical example in this case is the yeast we have already discussed that this is this pro, this reaction is very 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 upregulated in the case of yeast so that can be used for two purposes one which we have already discussed that if you uh, trying to make the bread what you have to do is you have you take the small amount of dough and then mix it along with the yeast molecules or the yeast organisms so what will happen is because it is a dough and it, there is a anaerobic condition inside the dough the uh, yeast will run its uh, glycolysis to produce the pyruvate but it cannot uh, mobilize that pyruvate to gen to uh, to gen to generate the energy in the krebs cycle instead it will it will run this reaction which means it will run the pyruvate to alcohol conversion and uh, in this process it is going to produce the carbon dioxide and once the carbon dioxide is trapped inside the dough it will make the dough very fluffy and that's how you you are going to have the bread which is having the uh, pores uh, in the in the alternate pathway you can also uh, you can also convert the pyruvate into the alcohol and that alcohol can be used for producing the different types of beverages similarly in a other pathway the when the pyruvate is getting converted into the lactic acid uh, this is very often uh, found in the case of another bacteria which is called as the lactobacilli so in the case of lactobacilli uh, you are actually converting the pyruvate to the lactic acid and lactic acid is actually reducing the ph of media and because of that it actually converts the milk to the curd and that's how the uh, lactic acid bacteria or lactobacilli has a relevance in uh, converting the milk to curd and production of the curd so the uh, Uh, the uh, anaerobic oxidation is having a very very huge industrial relevance we have only discussed the uh, two examples one is the production of ethanol or the production of the bread the other one is the production of curd but apart from these two pathways there are uh, many many pathways which are actually been found in many other different organisms to uh, generate the different types of metabolites and these metabolites have a very high economical values in the in the in the industrial context so what we have discussed so far we have discussed about the uh, cellular metabolism in the uh, in the in the in the mammalian cells and what we have also discussed the control as well as the relevance of these metabolic pathways in terms of driving the Uh, different types of uh, reactions as well as uh, the uh, in terms of running the uh, life cycle of the particular organism we have also discussed about the anaerobic oxidations and its relevance in uh, sustaining the life of the organism and at the end we have also discussed about the industrial relevance or the physiological relevance of these anaerobic pathways so with this we would like to conclude the lecture here and we uh, we will uh, continue our discussion about the uh, growth media as well as the different types of nutrient media which people used to grow the uh, prokaryotic cells as well as the eukaryotic cell in the subsequent lecture thank you